The racial profiling and arrest of world-renowned African-American professor Henry Louis Gates, Jr. on July 16th in his own home by Cambridge police. How much has really changed since the 1970s? In the 1970s in Boston, schools were segregated, they were separate, they were unequal, and they were inferior. In 1974, black parents were forced to go to federal court where they got an order mandating racial balance through busing to gain equal access to educational resources. Organized white racist mobs, when the busing began, stoned school buses carrying black children to school. They firebombed homes of black families and they attacked black people in the streets. Boston became a city where walking in the quote unquote wrong area could mean risking bodily harm and sometimes even death for black people living in Boston. There is a famous photograph of a young attorney named Theodore Landsmark who was walking across um, City Hall Plaza in Boston uh, and was attacked by a white, white racist mob who had um, an American flag on a flagpole and jammed it into his face and broke his nose. And that became the symbol of Boston for many years of the racist mobilizing there. The Workers' World Party's initiative led by our late um, chairperson Sam Marcy was along with a broad coalition of school bus drivers who were organized into a union, United Steelworkers, other trade unionists, black leaders from across the country, community activists of all shape and form. Um, we did, uh, in 1974, the tremendous march against racism that brought out 25,000 people from across the country. This um, march was a turning point in turning back the tide of racism. But now in 2009, we are again mounting a coalition and a mobilization against racist forces who are again trying to end busing and uh, trying to go back to what they call neighborhood schools, but they're actually separate and unequal schools for the black communities. And we are, um, in this current coalition, we are fighting against this and have temporarily succeeded in beating ba them back, but have to regroup and continue with more force in the fall. Now, our response, because of this whole, this whole history we have, the context, the party's position on the national question, was that we had to have a response to Professor Gates' arrest. We looked around, we saw no response from the progressive movement, which was shocking. I think we ca actually kind of waited a few days thinking there would be, um, and there wasn't. So we went out, we had a press conference on the steps of Cambridge City Hall, and our slogans were, uh, I think there, it's right there, Gates was right, the Cambridge police are wrong, apologize now. Racial profiling is a crime. And these were very important slogans that we developed because there, we found that there are many white workers and people in the progressive movement who had bought into the bourgeois line that it was Gates' fault that he was arrested because he acted stubbornly and he got angry. Um, if he had acted civilly, uh, he, this wouldn't have happened. It was his fault, and this was unfortunately common. Um, so we went out to say, no, it's racial profiling that's the crime. And we wholeheartedly, <laughs> we wholeheartedly support the right to defend oneself against racial profiling and racist attacks. And this recalled for us um, a, a case that we took up called the Somerville Five a few years ago that we worked on. It was uh, involved five black youth in Somerville, Massachusetts who were racially profiled by the police, brutally beaten and arrested while they tried to attend a summer festival. And two of the youth uh, physically defended themselves against the cops beating. Um, many said, well, 
they must have done something wrong if the cops acted that way, if they arrested them. And again, we said no, and we educate, tried to educate um, our fellow workers, white workers, that it was racial profiling and that we defend the right to defend oneself against racist attacks. So at the press conference, um, we were able to get quite a few people off the sidewalk from leafleting and talking to them that were, you know, residents of the Cambridge community. Um, and this is a great picture of um, Irene on our front page who spoke at the press conference, um, who just came, came up from the street. And she's talked about how uh, several years ago her son the cops banged on their door of their apartment in Cambridge. They had a photograph in their hand of a bl young black man. Um, they, they made her son come out onto the porch. They held the gun up to his head and, and with the picture in their hand. The picture looked nothing like him whatsoever. Uh, they terrorized the whole household and it's been something that they've never ever forgot. Um, I am also in the union at Harvard, Harvard Union of Clerical Technical Workers. Um, you know, and Harv Harvard is the bastion of liberalism. Um, and we have a no layoffs campaign there uh, that's, that, that, that is comprised of three unions. My union, SEIU, rep represents the maintenance worker and workers, and Unite HERE, which recognize, rec um, uh, represents the um, dining hall workers. So we're fighting against layoffs and cutbacks and speed ups and racism on the campus. And uh, these cutbacks have been dictated by Goldman Sachs and Citigroup, who we now we've realized over the past year are now running Harvard University. They have taken control of the endowment fund at Harvard and all the other major funds. Um, they have taken billions of dollars of the school's money and gambled it on the stock market. And now they're taking it out of the hides of the workers through layoffs and speed ups. Um, and Harvard has a history of racism and racial profiling, both by the Harvard University police and racial profiling in the workplace. And like Monica said, they use it deliberately and they use it to divide and conquer our unions and our workers. And a couple of, exa of examples of this are Dr. Um, S. Allen Counter. He's a professor of neuroscience at Harvard Medical School. He was racially profiled by Harvard police in Harvard Yard. Harvard Yard is like the quad in the center of Harvard. It's the campus. Um, he has an office there. He was racially profiled by Harvard police. He didn't have an ID. They took him to his office and asked two of the students if he belonged there, if he taught there. Um, it, and the students were mortified and horrified and totally embarrassed. This recent wave of layoffs has um, that we've been documenting in our No Layoffs campaign, uh, we see that it's predominantly older workers, uh, women workers, and workers of color. There was a black woman that we met at one of our rallies, um, three months shy of her retirement, who stood up in her workplace for the rights of other workers, who was called a racial slur by her supervisor and fought back, and was the first one targeted by her supervisor for a layoff. Um, and then SEIU, um, they are mainly immigrant workers. Uh, they, we found out just the other day, like two days ago, that workers who clean the Harvard Law School library, they're being forced to work at night with no air conditioning and no lights in the elevators. They're not allowed to talk to the workers who come in from the, the off, you know, they're coming off the night shift and the workers who are coming into the day shift. So um, we, also, just one other point about Harvard is that they teach racism. Um, let's not forget Larry Summers. He is now the economic czar, and he used to be the president of Harvard. And he was um, the one, as you recall, a lot of the women in the room might recall, that he said that we were uh, genetically inferior, that we wouldn't be able to um, understand math and science. Um, but our No Layoffs campaign, anyways, at Harvard has firmly said we will not be divided by racism, sexism, ageism, bigotry against lesbian and gay, bi and trans people, or anti-immigrant bashing, and we will continue. Racial profiling and racism are a poison in this country. The antidote is solidarity.